The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the part two of the Mega Playoff Pod, round three. If you missed part one, we had at Cousin Sal and Aaron Shots on. Part two, Chad Moma coming up. On the phone right now from the NFL Network. Mike Lombardi, what's happening? I'm just watching the tape of uh, the Patriots season coming to an end, Bill, as I sit here in my office at NFL Films and uh, just going over the, just reviewing the tape, as they like to say. All right. Well, I don't even know where to start, but where did, where did that Jets pass rush come from? Well, I don't think it really was as much a pass rush as it was that the coverage was so good. We talked about it last week. We said the Jets had one card to play, and they had to force Brady to throw the ball outside in the numbers with comebacks and win on the outside, and they executed the plan. New England knew the plan was coming, but really the receivers, there was nobody open, and Tom was holding on to the football, and it wasn't very comfortable. I mean, even the screen pass, when you watch it on the tape, if he throws it to him, it's going to be an eight-yard loss. I mean, they've got that play diagnosed completely. So I think more than anything, and, you know, there was the one time the rusher came free, but for the most part, when he got sacked in the red area, he was holding on to the football, because there was nobody open instantly, and they did a great job of rerouting the receivers, of hitting the receivers, being physical with the receivers, especially the tight ends, and they just outplayed the Patriots. I mean, it was just a, it's just no more simpler than that when you watch the tape. All right, well, it seems like that's a pretty simple reason why they shut the pads down. So here's my question. Why didn't anybody else do that? Well, because, because you can't live on the corner. The other teams, A, have receivers on the outside. B, you don't have corners that can cover. Those receivers. I mean, these receivers for New England ended up being the weak area, especially on the outside part of the field. You know, Brandon Tate and Deion Branch weren't exactly going to win against both these corners, Rivas particularly, and then of course Antonio Cromartie. Uh, so that's why it's very difficult for anybody to, to play this. And then you've got to understand how to play the style, and your linebackers have to be very well trained in terms of handling all the passing off. Because really, what, what it was, Bill, it was a it was a matchup zone defense that you see in college basketball they packed the middle of the field and they looked like they were playing zone and they passed off a guy to the next guy but everybody was clamped down so the quarterback never had a free window to throw the ball in was it different similar or kind of similar to the defense they used against the Colts well, no, it was different than the Colts, but but it was the same. It was the same flair and the same style because they didn't attack the pocket. They didn't go zero pressure. They didn't be, they didn't try to outsmart themselves. They played coverage. They wanted New England to methodically work the ball down. They wanted to reduce the game, which they did. The same thing they did in Indianapolis, and they wanted to get the game into the fourth quarter and have an opportunity to win the game. I mean, they they played the playoffs exactly the way you have to play the playoffs to win, especially if you want to make sure your quarterback doesn't throw interceptions. You want to make sure that your defense plays sound and you don't give up big plays. The, the part I don't understand, though, is, I mean, a lot of the times they're rushing three guys, and they were still putting on some pressure. It just seems like if you're going to play that many defensive backs, I understand the whole coverage sack mentality, but it doesn't seem like they should have been hitting Brady as much as they did, but also playing all those guys. Oh, well, I mean, look, the offensive line, everybody played a part in this, players, coaches, and scheme for New England. I mean, the Jets dominated the game. There's really no disputing that. But the reality is Brady has always been trained. One of the reasons you, you typically don't rush three against Brady, he's so well trained, he holds the ball longer. Anytime you watch a three-man rush in the game, the quarterback should hold the ball longer because typically the offensive lineman, five against three, they should be able to keep the pass rush out. And unless you have a dominant pass rusher, and frankly, what happened was the Jets, Sean Ellis, played really well. He bull rushed the pocket. He forced Brady to move around. And there was really no comfortable window to throw the ball in. Mm-hmm. And I think that's there lies the answer. The rush was good. They powered the pocket back. They didn't run up the field. And then the secondary did a great job of covering. Were you surprised, and I think I know the answer to this, that the pass just didn't go no huddle and just keep 
the same 11 Jets guys in the field and, and just try to control it that way. I think what I'm more, most surprised about was, yes, I think they should have played in a bunch formation more and, and made the Jets have to pass off at the line of scrimmage, especially on the outside. I think they instead of motioning and moving and doing all the stuff they did, the way the Jets were playing, the Patriots probably in, in hindsight would have been better off lining up in one formation and just letting that go and making sure they were able to execute out of that because oftentimes – because they were passing everything off, it was a little confusing to Tom more than it was confusing the Jets' defense. Well, you know I'm, I'm the master of, uh, of Madden and video games in general. Yes. If the Jets had thrown this defense at me, like if I'm playing my buddy Gus, yeah. and he's the Jets, and he throws the defense that the Jets throwing at me, here's what I would have done. Three tight ends, one receiver, pound the ball, send the tight ends out and a lot of different weird play actions and basically make them go back to a conventional defense. Why didn't they do that? Well, I think that, that there lies some merit to that. I think they tried to run the ball a little bit later in the game. And, of course, that fourth quarter where they really ate up a lot of clock running the football. But they got behind in the game. And they get you when you get behind in the games, that, that four, three tight end on the field. The other factor I think that played into this is I'm not sure Aaron Hernandez was healthy. I, I don't know. I really, totally agree with you. I don't think he was either. I think either. that really hurt them, especially when he couldn't win in one-on-one, when typically he was going to be a big part of the game plan. And I think yeah. his health – and, look, again, take nothing away from – what the Jets did because the Jets if you played that game 10 times in New England they were going to beat them 10 times the way they played New England played poorly and the Jets played great you uh we Belichick today he's got three picks in the top 33 and he's rehashing what just happened in this game if he's making a wish list of, I need this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, what does that wish list look like? I think he's going to have the come to Jesus meeting uh, like he did the year he signed Welker and traded for Randy Moss in 07. I think that's going to be, we need to get a better, we need to get better on the outside. We need to get a more complete outside receiver. We really need a number one receiver out there that we can live and die with so we can work the middle of the field. And when people play the scheme on us, we can attack outside. I think that's the, clearly the objective. Then they got to find some pass rush. I mean, you know, the defense cannot play in the game that they played. Look, the, Patri- the the Jets did exactly what they had to do. They took the Cleveland offensive game plan, and they took the Green Bay defensive game plan. Yep. And they combined those two game plans together, and this is where, where, where lied the victory. Now, the Patriots knew this was coming. And really, when you know it's coming and you try to prevent it and you can't, it tells you you don't have good enough players in certain spots. What about an offensive lineman? I think you certainly could use one of those. I think Vollmer is really a good player. They got some older guys, you know, Light and and Coppin at the end of at the end of their rope. They've got to try to replace some of those younger guys. Hey, look, th- this team when it started out, and this is you know, this is a really a lot of the good players are inexperienced. So that playoff game was really the first time they put their toe in the water. Again, you're not making excuses, but you know, we think of the Bay Patriots as an experienced veteran playoff team. I, I don't think that's the case. They were they made some really inexperienced plays out there. They didn't really capture the situations as well as they should so you know i think they are growing they are growing and they are going to continue to grow they're going to get younger they got top 33 this season 14 and 2 you just hate to see a season where you played this well just walk away and lose it like the falcons did and like the patriots did if you're the pats looking back would you rather have richard seymour the last two years or would you rather have that 17th pick in the draft well, I think you can't answer that question until you know who you pick. No, I mean, yeah, I want you have to answer it. No, well, you're, you're looking not, back and you're saying I could have had Richard Seymour these last two seasons. He could have been in that game yesterday. I, well, but, you know, look, Seymour wasn't going to make a difference in that game. He didn't play wide receiver. Yeah, good point. You know, you know he he wasn't going to make the difference. I would rather have the 17th pick because they were able to now if they utilize that pick and say they get a receiver of Des Bryant quality at the 17th pick. Yeah. Say they get that. If they had Des Bryant on the field, let's say they had that player there, you know, say they had DeMarcus uh, Thomas from the Jets, from the Broncos, say they had that big guy playing outside on the flank, you know, it's probably a different game. Oh, we could have had Des Bryant. <laughs> we, we passed him. I think we even traded out of that spot. Well, you got Devin McCourty, which is a good player. You can't, you know, you can't fill all the holes in the boat. Yeah, good point. We could have traded. We maybe we could have gotten both. I don't know. I'm grasping for straws right now. I'm still really well. It's a tough day for for Patriot fans. It's really yeah. tough, and I'm sure. And this is this is where you know you have to be honest with yourself, and you can't get caught up with, hey, look, uh, 
Jar- ben-, ben Jarvis Green Ellis is really a good back, but maybe if we had just a little bit better back and we could make him the number two back, we would be better. I think you have to be objective with your football team here and and make the sound, smart decisions and be critical and not get carried away with fourteen and two, and then not over over uh, react to the to the loss of the Jets. You have to be very tactical, much like the Jets. When I interviewed Rex Ryan, he watched the tape the first time they played it over twenty times. He knew what he was going to do the second time. He clearly had it in his mind. And now the Patriots, they can't answer on the on the blackboard. They have to answer with their players, and that's dangerous. And that's why you have to draft good. I mean, I knew we had cast-off running backs. I knew we didn't have a real number one threat. But I just thought Brady was on a level that this kind of game wouldn't happen. And they just got to him. And they, they got in his head, and he didn't play well. And there weren't yeah. guys open. It was a, it was a, there, there, there really weren't guys open. I mean, he he really he wasn't. And then there was one. There was there was breakdowns. I mean, you know, Dan Conley didn't play well. Uh, Coppin didn't play well. You know, so there, there was breakdowns all along. And and you know, when the team when you lose like this, it's never just one guy. It's the entire organization. Um, let's switch to Aaron Rodgers, who had the best weekend of anybody this weekend. Um, I don't know if you watched that game on tape yet, but. Is he? Does he now have the uh, the the championship belt as best quarterback in the league? Well, you know, I gave it to him this morning. I mean, really, Breeze won and out, Pitt Manning won and out, Brady won and out, and this guy's still playing. And the way he's playing, he was. And I wrote about it today on NFL.com. He's Harry Houdini in the pocket with a rifle for an arm. I mean, the amazing thing about Aaron Rodgers is how much he's improved physically from the time he worked out at Cal when he was coming out for the draft to today. It's unbelievable. His arm strength is different, and I wrote about this again this morning for my column. And he's completely different, and and he's improved. He's worked at his craft. And right now, when you combine him with these receivers on the flat outside where they can run with it after the catch, the Patriots would have had either of those receivers. It would probably be a different game. But on the outside, you know, those receivers are good. They do a nice job with their scheme. And then their defense plays fast, and they can rush the passer. So it's a good combination. But Rodgers is playing with his ability to move around the pocket. He's playing at a level above everybody else. We always hear about uh... – you know, the next generation of quarterbacks, Rodgers has mentioned, Roethlisberger, Flacco, Ryan. Um, now I guess Sam Bradford this year is a younger than them, obviously. But we can say now that Rodgers and Roethlisberger have separated themselves from the others, right? Oh, yeah, and I think the one who's going to separate himself again will be Sam Bradford. I mean, Bradford, with, with depending on who they hire as a coach, and if they hire Josh McDaniels, which could be a really good chance they will uh, if they do that, uh, then I think the, the Rams and Sam Bradford will take that mother may I step forward, and he'll be up there with Rodgers and, and Roethlisberger very soon. Matt Ryan, I think, uh, can we stop throwing his name in? or? Uh, you know, I think I think Matt – in two cents, in two points, or, you know, Matt is a good player. I think Matt, there's a perception around the league and through fans and Falcon fans that the Falcon offense is this really, really good offense. And, you know, we know Tony Gonzalez is over with, but the Falcons, like the Patriots, if they, if a team comes in and plays them a certain way, they don't have a left hand to get to. And so what they do is double Roddy White, you jam Tony Gonzalez, and you don't give Matt Ryan a lot of free throws, and you make Michael Jenkins beat you, you, you make uh, you know, Douglas have to make plays, and all of a sudden you're going to win the game. And if you can stop the run, you got you got a really good chance. So the recipe to beat the Falcons, the Falcons couldn't, even though they knew it was coming, they couldn't handle it because they didn't have the players to handle it. Um, Flacco's restaurant on Saturday. Unbelievable. He, I mean, they run four screens in the first quarter. <laughs> I mean, if you look at Flacco's completions, I mean, over half of them are on screens. And, and Pittsburgh's the worst team to run a screen against because they're a zone drop team. They have eyes on the backs all the time. Unless you hit it right, it's really not a good call. So, you know, I mean, it, it's remarkable. The best play was, you know, and it was one I thought he needed for the fourth quarter, was the throwback screen to the tight end. And Baltimore unveiled it in the first drive. And I said to my sons, I mean, he better save something for the fourth quarter. He's going to need it if he's running these plays now. And he didn't have anything for the fourth quarter. He did have he had two big drops in the fourth quarter that weren't his fault. Well, I, yeah, I mean certainly that's you know that that happens in games, but I just thought Baltimore's offense was really stale, and they were exactly what what I've been saying they were was slow, and they really can't play with any power. They need to rebuild this offense in the offensive line too. What happened to Ray Rice this year? I think Ray Rice got you know look 
their best play is a check down to Ray Rice. So I don't think anything really happened to Ray Rice, but I think Ray Rice suffered from that offensive line. Mm. I think they're losing Jared Gather early in the season. They made Michael Orr play left tackle, and I think most people can see now Michael Orr is not a pro Bowl left tackle. Michael Orr is going to have trouble against blue chip rushers. He needs to go back to the right side. I think they need to re-sign Gather at left tackle. He, now they have two tackles. It gives them a much better chance, and they've got to they got to repair the interior of their line, and starting with the center, Matt Burke's getting long in the tooth. So they've got to do a lot of things, and then they got to find some playmaker on offense. At the same time, 30-19, 2.07 left to go, tie game. And they're about to get the ball. I mean, can we really say their season was a total disaster? Like, they gave up that one big play, and that, that basically ended their season. Well, they also gave up the play to Palomola that cost them to have to play the game in Pittsburgh. So the, you know, the, the, the NFL is about one – it's not about one big play. It's about three or four – every game, is it comes down to three or four plays. Either you make it or you don't, you know. And and I think, look, Santana, Santana Holmes catches the ball in the back corner of the end zone. It's a great throw. It's an unbelievable catch. If he doesn't make it, there's a field goal. The game's a little tighter. Yep. You know, now – you know, so it's those plays that you have to make. Braylon Edwards just muscles himself in the end zone on a slant route. I mean, that play – you know, that you have to make, and, and, and LaDainian Tomlinson making that great catch on that flat route and getting in the end zone, there's another one. So you got to make the plays, and when your best players make them, you know, look, the play against Baltimore, I mean, everybody in the stadium knows Pittsburgh's going to run four verticals when it's third and long, and Bren's going to throw it up in the corner, just sat on it. He's young, he's inexperienced, he didn't get deep as he needed to get, and he blew the coverage. And as we talked about on the podcast, these Pittsburgh receivers, are really going to be now they're not ready right yet. I mean they're they're still just little pups. But next year Pittsburgh, when they repair this offensive line, Pittsburgh's going to have a top five offense, especially in the passing game because they've got good young fast receivers. Another play that uh, was a good Jets play was the guy catching the interception. That's a play that defenders drop all the time. We saw in the Seattle game the guy dropped the end zone interception that Cutler right. threw him. Um, Jets guy held on. They made all the plays. Pittsburgh. I mean, at the end of that game, they they brought in an offensive lineman. The announcer said we, they don't have any offensive linemen left. That he's the last guy. Um, can they physically hold up for this Jets game? Well, it's what cost them the first Jet game. I mean, they gave up the safety because they didn't block it right. Their offensive line kind of got beat up. And, and look, it's going to be difficult. But the one thing Roethlisberger always does is, uh, you know, he runs around, he moves around, he makes plays. But I just think the Jets are a bad matchup for Pittsburgh. They went in there and beat them earlier in the year. They're comfortable playing there. And I just don't see how this Pittsburgh offensive line is going to be able to match up and handle and give Ben enough time to make the plays he has to make. Yeah, because I think – I thought Baltimore was a little bit better. But Roethlisberger was better than Flacco, and their receivers were better than Baltimore's receivers. And really, that's why they won. But overall, I thought Baltimore, I, I don't know if they played that game ten times. I don't know how many Pittsburgh wins. This, this Jets going in there, it seems like the Jets are a better version of Baltimore. The Jets are a much better version of Baltimore, and, and Sanchez is playing better. He played he played well in Pittsburgh. He threw the ball much better. I mean, he's, he's 16 for 24. That's the first time he's played up in New England where he's played really well, and they've done a great job of giving him some easy throws and getting him into second and four, second and five, and being able to, to keep the play count in his favor, and then he doesn't put a lot of pressure. Even though he's wild and erratic at times, they can get him back on focus. And, the, you know, with these Jets, I mean, remember, they got some really good receivers. So if they, he gets them the football, they can make plays after the, after the catch. You came up with you, you, one of your favorite things is the 2020 quarterback, like Kyle yeah. Orton, the guy who just goes from 20-yard line to 20-yard line, never punches it in. Then he came up with a restaurant analogy for Flacco, that he may, he's making too many dishes, he doesn't have any right. specialty dishes. What do we make of Sanchez, the guy who can look like crap and then all of a sudden make three fantastic throws? Well, you know, to me, he's the, he's the Phil Negro. Win 20 games, lose 20 games. You just hope he, you know, the year he doesn't give up the big home run pitch. You know, that's the <laughs> thing with Sanchez. Because to me, he, he's, and, I, and I'll give him credit, he's growing and he's young and he's really developing. And the Jets have really cut their package of offense down. And they've made it so that they can, he's, he can function much better in it. And they're not putting him in awkward situations. Now he's still going to be inaccurate. He's still going to he's still going to be the Dave Kingman of the league, you know, where he's going to hit a three run homer because he connects on one, and he's going to strike out a bunch. So I would say it's more of a Dave Kingman type player. You know, but, don't look don't look at his percentage of passes. Look at the plays he makes when he has to make a Houston game, and you know he throws the ball there. He makes that play. You know, look at those, and I think that's really what you'll see. 
he it's it's a it's a home run or it's probably a long foul ball. What's weird? Ball. What's weird about him is his bad throws don't hurt them. It just seems like they sail over people's heads and don't get caught. Because they're really bad throws. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're not like, and, and, you know, they're not where the receiver can tip them up in the air. You know, most interceptions come, a guy gets a ball, a hand on the ball, the ball tips up in the air, and they catch it and go. You know, typically, you know, with, with Sanchez, when he loses his rhythm and he starts throwing wildly, you know, but they, see, now they've got him a little bit, and I think, take your hat off to the Jets' offensive coaches. They've done a great job since the Miami game. They've given him some rhythm throws, get him going, kind of let him build some confidence, and then when he has to make the tough throw, he feels good about himself, and they're not putting the bird. Look, yesterday was a perfect example. They they got that turnover. They run it. They get it down there. They're in a third and sixteen. What do they try to do? They're not going to force it in there. They run a draw. They get it. They kick. They miss the field goal. But that drive told you everything how they want to operate. Now they want to make sure that Sanchez is comfortable, and they're not asking him to do something where he may cost them and make a mental mistake, make a physical mistake by throwing the ball somewhere he doesn't belong. So, you know, I think it's. The, I think they found their rhythm with the guy. So if you're the if you're the Steelers, you you figure the Jets are going to play you, you know, pretty similar to how they played the Patriots with all those defensive backs and different looks, or do you think they're they're going to do something totally different? Well, I think that you know I think they're going to probably try to put Revis on Mike Wallace. See, Mike Wallace is the guy that's the he he really is the the balance of power shift. And if Revis can go in there and run with Mike Wallace vertically down the field, he, we know he can cover him on the short routes. Can he run with him down the field? And he doesn't give up a big play to Mike Wallace. I think they're going to have to cheat the safety over. And I think the burden of responsibility to win the game is going to fall upon the Antonio Browns, uh, the other receivers on their team because. That's who's going to have to win the one-on-one matchups. I, I, I don't think they're going to blitz them. I think they'll feel like the rush and pressure can get there because the offensive line is bad. I don't trust them. I don't trust those young receivers. Because I, I think if you're Pittsburgh, you're looking at this like, we're probably going to have trouble scoring. Because as you said, Revis is going to shut down. Revis is out of his mind right now. I mean, he did you see how he was playing Deion Branch? He was like almost like standing on his feet before before the ball was snapped. He was it's just like, like wherever you're going, Chad I'm Johnson. going. It's yeah, like he played Chad Johnson in a playoff game last year. It was just really. I mean, he just basically took him out of the game. Yeah, he's like you're you're not even going to touch the ball today. So if he takes Wallace out and you're the Steelers, you're thinking, all right, it's gonna we're gonna have trouble scoring. We're gonna have to win this game with our defense, right? That has to be their mentality. Hey, defense. If we're going to make the Super Bowl, you're going to be the guy. You have to shut down Sanchez. You have to do your thing. Can the Steelers' defense win this game? If they, the only way they win it is if they get two turnovers. They got to have to create some turnovers, and they have to create the vertical field position like they did against Baltimore. I mean, you know, Baltimore needed the field position when you only gain 125 yards of offense, and you get the ball on the 20 yard line on your opponent's 20, and you score two touchdowns or three touchdowns like they did. You know, that's critical. So I, I think for the for the Steelers to win, their defense has to make a play on the ball. They've got to they've got to play physical, and they've got to turn the ball over. I just don't see them generating a lot of points against the Jets because I agree with you. These young receivers, as much as I like them, they're still young receivers, and I think they're a year away from being really good receivers. Well, we saw yesterday with the Pats. It's, yeah. You never know about you never know about these young guys until they're thrown into a, into a playoff game. And they get and, rerouted like the Patriots receivers did, and the tight ends were getting beat up at the line, and yeah. all of a sudden it's not as easy as it was, and the game's changed a lot. Yeah, all of a sudden you're getting chipped every play. Um, and it's going to be interesting. I, I have to say I'm leaning – Leaning toward the Jets, I think. Oh, I, I think the Jets are the right. I was on Morning Joe this morning, and I picked the Jets in the game because, to me, the the Steelers really, really don't have the right team because of their receivers. Look, they can't put Randall all out there, and they can't put. I mean, they'll use Hines Ward, but really, he's they're not going to make plays. They need that, those fast guys, and those fast guys can make mistakes. And then, look, it's tough to win when you lose your left tackle. I've always thought, one of the rules I've always had in, in the league, when you lose your left tackle, most teams don't have a backup left tackle. So when you lose your left tackle, typically you lose your season. And the Steelers have lost their left tackle, they've lost their right tackle, and they've been able to endure it, which is a testament to their competitiveness and their toughness as a team. But this is going to be hard to overcome with Jonathan Scott at left tackle. I think it's going to be really hard for them. So when you look at the, how they won last week, great crowd. Got a turnover inside the 20. Um, one really long pass. I mean, it's just that some things went their way in that game. I think if you're a Ravens fan, that's a much tougher loss to deal with than the Patriots' loss. Well, As the a Patriots, Patriots fan, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at that game going, yeah, we should have lost. They beat us. 
They beat the hell out of you. Yeah, and I, I think too, if 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 you're a Ravens fan, said all if we would have just ran the, run the ball in the second half. I mean, the Ray Rice fumble didn't happen, and all of a sudden the Flacco makes the bad throw. If you made the Steelers play on a long field, I'm not sure they were going to score on the on the Ravens defense. Yeah, you know, they got the one break with the long pass, but I don't think they were going to score. I think they needed the short fields to be able to score, and that played perfectly, and it got the crowd back in the game, and it really got of electrified their offense. And all of a sudden, I think we can do some things. So if they don't. If they play vertical field position with them, I think it's even harder. And the other concern is Palomalu was was not good in that game. No, and, I mean, and might no. not be healthy. It's like an Aaron Hernandez thing. He doesn't look healthy to me. Yeah, and you know that that's the thing about Palomalu. Sometimes I've watched him this year. He hasn't looked the same, and sometimes he's looked like his old self. So I, there's something going on medically with him because he's not the same player he once was. No, he's not wreaking havoc. Um, the other game, Green Bay, Chicago. What does Chicago have to do to win this game? Well, you know, Chicago plays them tough. I mean, Chicago plays them really well. I mean, when you watch the tape of the game in Chicago, Green Bay should have won the game, but Chicago's there. They they threw the ball even then. This was before the 0 for 10 and the, and the 11 sacks of the Giants. The Bears, with their bad line, moved the ball effectively on Green Bay. Cutler was good that night. He made plays. Then they go up to Green Bay at the end of the year, and it's a 10-3 game. They're making plays. I mean, I just think the Bears played the Packers. As much as I love the Packers and as much as I love Aaron Rodgers, I think Cutler is flying under the radar how good he's playing because Rodgers is playing at such a higher level. And, and, you know, really for me with Cutler, it's more about does he make the dumb mistake when he's in the red zone? You know, the interceptions out of the field, everybody's going to make some of those. The ball gets tipped up in the air. It's not maybe not his fault where the, 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 we thought the receiver was going to break in, but where he kills you is what he did on Sunday when he throws the ball to Seattle and Seattle drops it. Now, yep. if they catch it, that's when he kills you. So if he protects in the red zone, I, I think Chicago matches up. That they're not afraid to play him. They played them the four. The field will be slow, which will hurt Green Bay's team speed on defense, which plays perfectly into Chicago. So, you know, I, I'm favoring Chicago in the game. I picked, uh, I picked against Chicago minus 10 last weekend, mostly because Cutler in the playoffs, I just didn't trust him. I needed to see it from him. And uh, I thought he did everything I needed to see. He he played great, and these receivers are really good, and they're a tough matchup. You need good receivers against Green Bay's corners. You've got to be able to handle, you know, you, they've got to be able to handle Clay Matthews. So I, I like the matchup for the Bears. I think the Bears are confident they can play them, and they're going to be disciplined in what they do, and and they'll reroute the receivers, and hopefully, you know, they can make a few plays. But I, I think the Bears match up well. Could you? So could we really see a Jets Bears Super Bowl? I think we could. How I think we could. I mean, look, the Packers are playing well too. We could see a Jet Packer one. We, you know, I mean, what these four teams? You know, they're 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 four teams that you know. I mean, it's amazing the two and six seeds get, are both in the thing. It's really amazing. Would you say? I mean, wouldn't you put the Bears cornerbacks in like the top three or four in the league? Well, Tillman plays well against certain guys. You know, he has some trouble with guys that have a lot of great quickness, but he's playing much better now. So, and they play, and they're very, and they play more man coverage. I know all the people on TV talk about, oh, they play the Tampa. They do play Tampa, but they'll they'll get in a man to man game with you a little bit, and they'll run with you. So they play much better than people give them credit for. But in their front, I mean, you know, Peppers. He can be the guy that really plays. If he, they put him over on the right side, which they'll do at times against Balaga, he can create some havoc. And the only way you're really going to get to Rodgers, you got to pressure him and keep him and tackle him. I mean, Atlanta learned that one. Atlanta pressured him a couple times, just didn't tackle him. But we can say that their secondary is good enough to not get torched by this Packers, by all those guys, right? You know, and I think the weather's going to play a factor into it as well. I mean, yeah. it's not perfect conditions like it was in the, in, in the Georgia Dome. Windy would help them. Wendy would help him. I mean, the field's going to help him as well. I mean, the field's going to help him and the, help the Bears' offense. Wow, Jets Bears. I mean, that, that would be. I, I, that's what I'm seeing right now. I, I think the Jets right now are just playing, especially defensively. And give Rex right. You know, Rex for all his talking is really a good strategic coach, and, and he's yeah. done a great job of of coming up with the game plan that he had a, that gave his team the best chance to win. Maybe it wasn't the best one he likes in terms of how he calls a game, but it was, gave his team the best chance to win. And Belichick now, he's lost his last three playoff games. Yeah. He, I think Brady started out 10-0, and 0, and now he's 4-5 four, he's four and five in his last nine playoff games. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm hard-pressed to remember 
the last time Belichick really just coached the pants off somebody in a playoff game. I guess you'd have to go back to 06 in San Diego. Well, I, I think right now, I, I really think right now, as the team has been in transition, I think this is going to be a long off season, and I think the infuse, there's going to be an infusion of some other kind of players coming in there to blend with these young players that they have, and I think that'll give them. I think they have the foundation laid, and they're. I mean, you didn't expect them to be fourteen and two this year. Yeah, it sounds like you think that they just severely overachieved, and it caught up to them. Well, I do, I do think they severely overachieved, especially. I mean, you know, it's hard to win in the NFL without a pass rush. I mean, yeah. You know, and and but but again, they got soundly beaten by the Jets. So I'm not taking anything away from. Them, but I think really when you watch them, you know, Brady played lights out. They're 14 and two. They had a couple things go their way, and they just laid down an egg in in, in the game against the Jets. And now you go back to the drawing board. You say, hey, we got to get a pass rusher. We got to get an outside receiver. And I think now. He won't be able to be forced to play a certain way, and then he then he won't have to listen to well. He got out coached in the playoff game because he'll have enough arsenal in his tank to be able to contend with the things that happen. I mean, we knew we and you and I have talked about this. I think even on the podcast, like this Pats team, it was tough to tell how bad the defense was or if it was mediocre or whatever because every game they were taking these twenty one point leads. And, and they cannot play. They, we knew though they cannot play in a tight game, and that's what we were. Yeah. Rex Ryan was counting on even when that game got fourteen to eleven, you know, they came right back out, they blow a coverage and, and Kotri runs it down there and they give up the touchdown pass. If they hold him to a field goal there, I mean it's a great play. Hold him to a field goal at seventeen eleven, you're still in the game. You know, now it's twenty eleven, it's a two possession game, it's very difficult. You know, and I think the Pats defense has got to find a, they need a James Harrison type player coming off the edge to wreak havoc to really disrupt the passing game because they have the coverage people right now. They just don't have the rusher in the front seven that can create problems. Now, are there free agents that uh, it's so tough to try to predict what the future of this league is going to look like? But are there like who, in your opinion, who are the top three free agents next year? You know, I'd have to really study it because I don't know what the rules are going to be. You yeah. know, that's the problem. Is it going to be six-year free agency? Are we going back to four years free agency? Because that opens up a whole other pro- a whole other set of players. You know, and, and uh, because the Pat, the Pats fans like when Asamoah's contract got voided or whatever, and the Pats fans are like, "Wow, if we signed him and I we put him with McCourty, you know, we basically locking down everybody, and then we could just blitz all the time." I would think, to me, they would be better served to go find themselves a, a pass rusher. A, you know, and I know those are hard to find, but I think that's really what they need more than anything. Is they need a dominant player on the edge. They need a they need a guy like what, what Cameron Wake gave the Miami Dolphins this year. Yep. And look, they found him up at the CFL. So <laughs> they got to find that kind of player to create the problems for for the other opponent. They don't have a blue chip. See. The thing that always bothers me is I go back to the blue chip theory. You got to have blue chips in the offensive and the defensive line. And other than Vince Wolfolk, you know, on the defensive line, they don't really have a blue chip player. Well, we lost Ty Warren, which everybody forgets. But which hurt. I think he was up there. Um, and that's really it. Just those two. Um, out of the four teams left, who do you think has the most blue chips? Who would I think has the most what? Who has the most blue chips out of the four remaining playoff teams? Well, yeah. Did you say the you know, Jets? It, it, it's either the, to me right now. It's the Jets or the Packers. I mean, the Packers' defensive line is playing really well. Yeah, they, they really are playing. And you, when you count Matthews as a defensive lineman, you know, and and he comes off the edge, and Eric Walden's playing really good. They pick him up off the off of the Miami practice squad. Green Bay does a great job in pro personnel finding these younger players. I mean, Tremont Williams is on the street, and he they pick him up. I mean, they do a really good job in that area, and, and they find players. You know, people get mad at them because they don't get after free agents. And, I, you know, I think if they had Marshawn Lynch on their team, they probably would be a lock to go to the Super Bowl. But the reality of it is, is Green Bay finds these guys on other practice squads. That's really where they do the best job in the National Football League of, of securing these unknown players where they sign, they put them on the practice, and all of a sudden these guys are players. Are you sad the season's almost over? Um, of course. I mean, you know, but the good thing about uh, the one thing about football is you can always watch the tape and you can go back. And, and part of the joy of being in the league is figuring out your team's problems and trying to solve them and build for the next year. You know, Art Modell used to tell me all the time, kid, we sell hope in this league. And, and that's true. There's hopeful for next season. And you have to get over the sting of losing. And you've got to be able to put it aside and make really good decisions, not based on emotion, but based on your analysis and your studying of the team. And I, I really enjoy that as a personnel guy. You love free agency, you love the draft, and you love rebuilding your team. 
And you have to study the teams that have won and figure out why they're winning so you can duplicate their success or borrow some of their ideas and recipes and put them in your own. What are you going to do during the lockout? Are you going to open like a diner? No, well, I'd like to. You know, I, you know, my goal in life is to have like a diner in the back of the woods and not use it as a diner, but make it as an office and just watch tape in there and have like a counter and basically run it as a diner. You know, it's <laughs> the lottery. That's really what I would like to do. You know, all right. and then have like screens on the, all over the wall. And then you could come over and we could make milkshakes and we could have home fries and we could watch all the games. You could call it Lombardi's and the signature breakfast would be called the trophy. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we, I would take something from the Emmett Fitzgerald. Fellas, it's too rough to feed you, Diner. You know, I think that would be the one. Were you okay with the Golden Globes last night? I, I, I was uh, I was a little dumb with television, so I, I have to be honest, I didn't watch it. Was my uh, Tina Hedricks there? Was she there? No, nah, January Jones uh, knocked it dead with a, with a great dress. This is the highlight of the uh, – other know, than Ricky it, Gervais. It's kind of hard for January Jones to mess it up. I mean, really, it is. I mean, well, she it, got very skinny, though. I, you know, I know as, uh, as full-blooded Italians, we don't like when, our, when we get too, too skinny. Yeah. She, she was definitely skinny. Yeah, well, she, it's hard for her to mess that up. I couldn't yeah. imagine that. No, I, I, I have to check out. I'm sure you'll have a review of it. Is the sports gal going to write a review for us? She, uh, she actually didn't see it. We have it on tape. But uh, oh. Ricky, Ricky Gervais' monologue – you got to go on YouTube and watch that. It was really okay. good. He won't be invited back next year. <laughs> <laughs> he crossed about nine lines. It was awesome. Um, all right. Mike Lombardi, we will talk to you before the Super Bowl. We'll see you on Inside the NFL this Wednesday night on uh, Showtime. We'll see you on the NFL Network. As always, thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right. Back in cleanup, as always, from ESPN the Magazine, ESPN.com, the insider from Vegas. Chad Millman, what's happening? How you doing, man? Uh, I'm, I'm all right. I'm some surprisingly good spirits. So I had a buddy who's watching the game yesterday. He was a huge Patriots fan. Yeah. And, like, at one point his kids were doing something that he didn't like, and he got so mad about it. And a buddy and I were standing, like, 15 feet away, and we're like, I don't think he cares if they play on the stairs that much if the Patriots aren't losing. Right. You know, it's like everything is affected. Yeah, that's true. Um, it was a tough one. It you know, have we gotten to the point where every round something crazy has to happen? I think we have. And as long as the Jets and Packers are involved, it is almost required that something crazy will happen, especially the Jets. I mean, this team, you can't read this team anymore because they're so inconsistent. And you don't know if you're getting the team that everyone thought was going to be a Super Bowl contender in the beginning of the year. Are you getting a team that stunk against the Ravens? Are you getting a team that dominated? Are you getting a team that went in the tank in the middle of the year? You don't know how to play them, and you don't know how to bet them, more importantly. Yeah. Um, well, let's go over from the uh, the Vegas side of, of what happened this weekend. We almost had a dramatic backdoor push in the Seahawks-Bears game that uh, would have been one of the worst backdoor covers slash pushes ever, right? Yeah, um, I can't imagine. I don't think that game ever got to um, – it never got to 11, certainly. I don't think it got to 10 and a half either. So it definitely would have been a push had he gone for the two-point conversion. But that was excruciating, absolutely excruciating to watch, both as a Bears fan, knowing what it meant for the next week, and also, if you were a gambler, seeing that 35 to, what was it, 35 to 10 at one point yep. just dwindle down, uh, yeah, that's, that's a hellish way to do it. Even at that point, it's 35 to 10, you know, late in the fourth quarter, you're thinking, all right, 10 points is a lot to cover, but you feel like you're somewhat protected from the back door. And with the Bears defense, you just never know. They just leave everything wide open. And it had a great moment where after they scored the touchdown to cut it to 12, they cut away to something, and you couldn't see if they were going for the two or it was the kicker. And it was like six seconds of chaos. And, and then <laughs> it was like, oh, come on, come on, let's, let's see Hasselbeck. And they cut, and it's the guy lining up the kick. And we were all like, oh! Yeah, I, you know, you don't know what he possibly could have been thinking, except he wasn't thinking about all the gamblers out there who were hoping to not lose their money. Oh, well, Sal and I talked about this earlier, but my theory is, because the conventional wisdom is you go for it when you're down five and not when you're down 12. Right. But if you have a ton of momentum, you should just go for it when you have the momentum. And they had the momentum, and they just should have gone for it there. But whatever. Um, the paths, the ramifications, uh, big picture Vegas, include the Super Bowl odds. Now the Packers are the favorites, correct? Yes, correct. Um, the AFC line dropped three points. Correct. Went the AFC, minus AFC four line. to minus one. And the Pack are now eight to five, I think, uh, Super Bowl odd favorites. And then the Steelers are two to one. 
Unbelievable. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's in, it's insane. That's totally, completely insane. I think the Bears are 9-2. to two, And um, what do we have the Jets at? Uh, I forgot what the Jets were at, but it's lower I, than 9-2 to two because... Um, I thought it was 7-2. to two. Maybe it's 7-2. to two. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I wrote on Friday that I thought that AFC line was too low because, assuming the Pats had gotten in, they would have been favored by at least six over anybody. Then after that Rodgers performance on Saturday, I think, you know, I think that definitely changed the equation a little bit, and then obviously the Pats lose. And then Well, the thing that scares me about Rodgers, and this is why... You know, I tweeted out yesterday that the, the Packers were, were going to be three-point favorites over the Bears in the NFC Championship game, and people pounced on me like, you're crazy. There's no way the Packers are going to be favored over the Bears at home. And, and you know, all these all this vitriol, the Packers were one of the wise guy favorites to begin the year. Then they lose all their players. They go through this huge, terrible slump. Now they are playing like the team all the wise guys thought they would be at the beginning of the year. So, of course, they're going to be favorites. In fact, they're going to be, the, the, the money is going to pour in on the Packers from all perspectives, I think, um, because this is a team that, at its best, is definitely better than any other team playing right now. And certainly, they'll be favorites in, in the Super Bowl if they get that far. Yeah, it seems like they're favorite three now. It seems like that line, I think, is going to move to three and a half. you agree? Well, in some places, it already has. Um, you know, and what's going to happen is, you know, at the Hilton right now, it's three and a half even money. So, you know, you're doing the, the three and a half plus 100, or you're basically buying that half point for the Bears and paying three and a half minus probably 120. So, um, you know, we talked about that last week about the way these things are priced. The sports books are going to do everything they can to keep these games in that three range or play with the VIG at three or get it to three and a half and play with the VIG there because they're going to be so close, and three is such a key number, that there's too much um, vulnerability if they go too far down or too far up on one side of that number. From the guys you talked to, how did, did it seem like people were playing the Jets' money line yesterday? No, they were actually playing the Pats' money line. It was weird. Um, there were more guys playing the Jets and the spread than the Pats' money line. Only one guy I spoke to, this guy Jeff Kulesa from Wonder Dog Sports, okay, he was great, and when I spoke to him on Friday, and I did him in my column on Friday, um, he was like, to me, the best value right now is the Jets' money line, and because you never know what you're going to get with the Pats. You could get the team that played the past eight weeks and did really well, um, and that would blow out the Jets, but there was a lot of trepidation on that sort of thinking um, from the wise guy perspective, and he felt like he was getting much better value on the money line, so I know he played the money line, but um, most guys at least in the public perspective, were playing the Pats money line. So the Pats game yesterday actually saved a lot of the books because between the Pats money line and the parlays and teasers were all tied into the Pats winning, they actually ended up, you know, fair to middling and not losing as much as they could have because they were so heavy on the Packers. Um, they were heavy on the Steelers, and they were heavy on the Bears. So getting the, getting the Pats to lose was actually a big win for them. Who's the biggest public team right now? It's got to be the Packers. You know, they're I agree. moving some some of these some of these books are moving it on air. They're not their their lines on air. And what that means is basically they're sort of getting a sense of where the money is going to come in, and they're going to move the number based on that, not necessarily based on any action. And so, if a game is going three and a half right now, a lot of that is anticipation of public money coming in on the Packers because that's exactly what's going to happen. Everybody is steaming the Packers right now, whether they're sharps or the public. And mainly because of Rodgers. Yeah, of course because of Rodgers, although the defense is phenomenal. And that's as, as a Bears fan, looking at this game, I feel like you're getting a steal playing the Packers at minus three because I don't think the Bears' offensive line can match up with the Packers. The Bears still have too many lapses in the offensive line. And you can see in, this, in the Seahawks game, they should have been up in that game 35 nothing at halftime. But they have these mental lapses with the offensive line, and you know it doesn't hurt you against the Seahawks, but it will kill you against the pass rush of the Packers. And so, to me, if you're getting the Packers at three, um, you know, that was a value. We had Mike Lombardi on right before you. He said that, uh, you know, he thought the the Bears beat him once. They hung tight with him in a Week 17 game that didn't mean anything. He thought, for whatever reason, they're a really good matchup. You know what? I heard someone else, I heard, uh, someone else say that to me, too, today. 
I disagree. Um, I mean, partially because I'm expecting the worst, and and you know, because if the Bears win, they go to the Super Bowl, and I'll be happy, and I just don't see that happening. But uh, I also think I watched every Bears game this year, and that page, that that Packers game specifically, they had no business keeping that game close. The Packers had 18 penalties, and the Bears don't aren't even in that game if the Packers don't have 18 penalties. Yeah, but that was a different Bears team at that point of the year. I mean, I think since the bye week, that's. Wouldn't you say that they've evolved in a good direction? I, oh, of course they have. Yeah, they've been much, much better. But I still see elements of their game that worry me. And that offensive line, even though they've had the same starting five, still worries me a lot. There's still too many holes. And to me, I just feel like if you were getting the Packers, strictly from a betting perspective, to me getting the Packers at minus three um, is a good play because I actually don't know that the Bears will be able to stay with Aaron Rodgers. He's so accurate. Charles Tillman, at least once during the game, he will make some good plays, but he will slip, he will get a pass interference, or he will drop an interception at one very important part of the game, and that could be the difference between you know a tie game and a seven-point game. It's funny. I, Lombardi and I talked about this. To me, it seems like the Bears have really good cornerbacks, and yet he, he was a little lukewarm on them. Every time I've watched them, it always seems like their cornerbacks are doing a good job. Maybe he shows up in the high-profile games, but Maybe. You know, Lombard, Lombardi has probably watched more film on this than I have watched I know. games. And he is one of those guys where people love him, and people are, as Bears fans, you love him and you're afraid of him. Because he always, always, something weird happens in a game that he's playing in, and it costs the Bears something big. So it happened pa- yesterday. He had that interception. He was about to make that interception. Instead, it, but he tips it up, and Mike Williams catches it. It becomes 35-17. So if the Packers are the favorites right now, then mm-hmm. why is the AFC favorite over the NFC? Isn't that interesting? I actually don't know. Um, I was thinking about the same thing this morning when I was we'll looking find at that out. When you, when you write about it this, this week, get, get the answer. We want the answer to that. You're, you're always giving me good tips, and I appreciate that. That makes no sense, though, to me. It seems like the, 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 the NFC should be favorite, or at least be a pick em. I completely agree, unless you know they're thinking, if perchance the Bears get through... They're going to be dogs to both the Jets and the Steelers. That's what so, I was thinking. It seems like it's an emotional, or not emotional, but it's just, it's a built-in hedge just in case the Bears get there because the Jets and the Steelers would be favored over the Bears, but the Packers would be favored over the Jets and the Steelers. Exactly. But not by as much as if it was Steelers, Bears, or Jets, Bears. Right. What are, just out of curiosity, what do we think the lines would be for those games? You know, I was thinking about that. I feel like um, if it's Steelers, Bears... My first instinct that it's probably about four. I would have said six. I'm thinking, well, from four to I guess five and six, you're looking at pretty dead numbers. So I would say, you know, could be four, could be six. I think with the Jets, it's probably it's a little less than four. Yeah, um, four or three and a half. Probably yeah, it's four. Probably three. I'm thinking. And then let's see, the Packers and the Steelers. That's going to be close. That's going to be three. And then the Packers and the Jets is probably going to be six. Wow. You, so you're not respecting the Jets that much. I don't think that when it gets to the game, you've got to remember it's all about public opinion, too. I don't think when it gets to the game that the Jets will have as much respect from the public as the Packers will. Well, I also think when you look at where that game's being played, Dallas, basically, uh, you, you, I can't, that's a retractable stadium, right? Yeah. That thing should have every. It should fly that stadium. It's dome. It's got. It just seems like that kind of nice for the Packers. Nice for their fast receivers. Nice I mean, for at the end of the day, everyone bets a quarterback, and Aaron Rodgers is playing as well as any quarterback can play right now. I mean, the guy had five incompletions the other night. Right. So if that's going to be the case, they're going to bet Mark Sanchez. Going to bet Aaron Rodgers before they bet Mark Sanchez, and that's why I think the number will open a little bit higher. Out of the guys you talked to, who's the hottest sharp right now? Who's the guy we should be riding? Well, Wonder Dog has been great. I mean, you know, he nailed the Steelers game this weekend. He nailed the Jets game this weekend. Um, I thought that was fantastic. He was on the Bears, only I didn't write about it. Um, Teddy Covers was great this week. He was all over the Jets. He was all over the Packers. He loves the Packers right now. Um, so those two guys, when I checked in with them, were fantastic. I mean, they, they were right on the money in their games. It seemed like the Sharps were kind of offended by the Patriots line. They felt like... Uh... Well, I think they were, and I think a lot of that was the fact that when this game happened a month ago, 
the spread was, I think it opened at four and closed at three and a half. Yep. And even though that was a blowout, you know, nobody believed that the Pats were now, what, six to five to six points better than the Jets. They yep. thought that was all based on public perception and all based on the fact that the Patriots had played absolutely perfect football the last eight weeks of the season. And football cannot be played perfectly for, throughout an extended period of time. That's as long as you can possibly do it. And so they were all planning on, you know, they were all expecting a regression to the mean. And the fact that the Patriots would fall back, they'd have some turnovers, they'd not be nearly as good and, and efficient as they have normally been in the last eight weeks. And so they thought there was just huge value to be exposed there. And the other thing I think, um, they do factor in the psychology of the game a little bit. Of course. And it's huge motivation. You know, everyone else thinks, Oh my God! From the public perspective, they're all thinking the Patriots just beat this team a month ago, forty-five to three. They're so much better than the Jets. But the Sharps are thinking the Jets had a really bad day. They had lost their quarterback of the secondary in um, Jim Leonard that you know week for practice. They had lost another guy. They were playing literally scrubs in the backfield in the defensive backfield. So now all of a sudden they're going back into New England. They're so super motivated. This has not been a team this year that crumbled when there were huge distractions off the field. And so they're getting eight and a half or nine and a half or whatever they were getting. That's great value for them because they're seeing it the complete opposite of the way the public sees it. Yeah. And um, what was the other game that was like that? This year? No, the, I mean, the Steelers-Ravens was a little bit like that. It was just everybody was so convinced that was going to be a three-point game that – and I don't know if the Sharps felt this way, but it just seemed like when when people say stuff all week is going to play out a certain way, then you knew it wasn't going to end in the three point right. game. Right. You know, somebody was going to win by at least, I don't know, seven. Well, that's what scares me about the Steelers, and that's why the Steelers should scare the Jets. And this is a big difference to me in the, in the Patriots and the Steelers, is that I think the Steelers can play better Sandlot football than the Patriots can. Yeah. And so whatever scheme the Jets come up with, that will be distracting for Ben Roethlisberger. If things break down the way they did for Brady, Roethlisberger runs around. He seems to be more capable of sort of maneuvering on the fly than Brady, who is by by all means brilliant. And I, you know, I, I love the guy, but he doesn't play Sandlot the way that the, the Steelers do. And they just let it go. And Roethlisberger runs around, and you know, he says, "Go run a fly." And these guys are running flies when he's drifting out of the pocket, and so. It's a different ball game. That, to me, is what I would be a little afraid of if I were a Jets fan, and certainly what I'd be afraid of if I were a Jets better about that three and a half is um, that the Steelers things break down and they make big plays, and and so that leads to bigger scores. You don't have Super Bowl MVP odds in front of you, do you? I don't, but I don't even think they would have them up yet. Say, so, you know, yeah, you're right. Maybe they wait till the Super Bowl. Yeah. So if they had him up now, it's almost... What are you doing? It's like you're, you know, you could do positions or you could do, you know, you got to list like 15, 20, 30 different guys and half of those bets aren't going to matter. And so why would anyone take a bet on, you know, they're not going to give you a great number on Aaron Rodgers or Jay Cutler or Ben Roethlisberger or Mark Sanchez because any one of those guys can make it and why would anyone bother wasting their money? Because, well, because if you like the Packers to win it all, and what are their odds for the Super Bowl? They're eight to five. And Aaron Rodgers was two to one to win the Super Bowl MVP. It would just make more sense to bet Aaron Rodgers because if the Packers win the Super Bowl, he's going to be the MVP. Yeah, but that's a nickels on the dollar bet. I mean, that's the kind of bet a sharp would make where you're just looking to get the best possible price. So why not? You're going to get that anyways when the when the Super Bowl happens. So why not just save your money and wait until the Super no, Bowl? No, they starts? they've swung that now. When they have the game, they make it so that. It's almost like you're better off betting the team than the MVP. Oh, I disagree. I feel like you're better off betting the MVP. That's exact. I think that's what happened last year. It used to be that case, but wasn't last year? I thought. I thought they swung like it I so that the breeze is out. Last year, why don't I just bet the MVP of this game? Since he's going to, if if this team wins, he's going to be the reason why. I have this vague memory of Breeze being like. The Colts were minus five. I think the Saints were plus 200 for the game. Right. And I think Breeze was like plus 180 for MVP. It was weird. 
It was like they have to cover it a little bit in case one team wins, but the other, the opposing team played so well, or whatever the guy on the other team. You might be right. I could have sworn it was the other way around because I have all these memories of emails asking me what's the better value. Is it, hmm. Should I be playing the MVP or should I be playing the team? Well, let's re- let's remind ourselves to talk about this in two weeks because okay. this is a fun one. I do think that, uh, you know, you just look at the history of the Super Bowl, especially if it's a good QB, he's going to win the MVP. Oh, yeah. It's a, you're going to need – the only way is if it's a situation where, like, Greg Jennings catches nine passes for 220 yards and three touchdowns or – Whatever. Right. But other than that, it's going to be the quarterback. It's going to be the quarterback. So who are you leaning toward this week? I'm probably leaning towards the Packers, and I'm probably leaning towards the Steelers. Hmm. I think I'm leaning I'm not the other waffling way. at all. I am coming in with an opinion. You know what's funny is I've totally betrayed the principles that I used for the, for the Hilton Super Contest all year. I betrayed them. What would you do? With my round two picks. Really? I, knew that, I knew the Pats line. I thought the Pats were going to win. But the line was too high, and all year I always went for the value lines, and it was clear that that line was two points too high because the Pats were such a public team, right? And because of the forty-five to three, but yet it just should not go from three to eight and a half or three and a half to eight and a half. But I, I, I can't not take the Pats. I'm a Pats fan. It's the you know then I get heat from back home and all that stuff. But right. I knew going in that that line was too high, and then uh, the the other one was. Um, the the Falcons Packers. Yep. I went all year. I always took. I'd always came down and like I don't want to be stuck with the team that's not the best team in the game if I'm making a pick. And I knew the Packers were better, but I really thought like it was going to be home field, special teams, Packers making mistakes. I was banking on the Packers not to play well for me to cover instead of the Falcons just being better, which is I think at, at this level you can't do. And well, you weren't wrong though because when that game opened. It was, I think, two and a half, and immediately got bet down to one. And we talked about this. And then during the yeah. week, the game got bet back up to two and a half because there was a huge sentiment on the part of wise guys. It was actually a bunch of syndicate betting. But there was a huge sentiment on the part of the wise guys that said, I've got a team that is great at home with a quarterback who is historically unflappable that only lost one game this year and is coming off a bye, um, playing against a team that might be getting – a little bit more public sentiment than it probably should be getting. And so they pushed the number back up to two and a half. But, you know, nobody was counting on the fact that the Packers are just a juggernaut right now. And the Packers are playing, as I said, the way they are supposed to be playing, the way that everyone expected them to play from the beginning of the year when they were one of the better value picks to win the Super Bowl in terms of future odds. The problem was I had watched that first Packers-Falcons game, and the the Packers were better, and they just shot themselves in the foot. It was one of those games, and it was – I had picked the Falcons, and I came out of that game going, thank God, they, they should not have won that game. Right. So that that was in the back of my head. And then, uh, you know, the other thing with the with the Falcons, they lost that game to New Orleans that was a pretty big test for them on Monday night. But they also had that San Fran game earlier in the year um, where the guy had the game-winning interception and fumbled and then, it. And, right, right. And then the Baltimore game on Thursday, which, you know, Baltimore really should have taken care of business in that game, and they didn't, and they had a couple of dumb penalties, but they easily could have been 5-3 and three at home, you know. And oh, I yeah, think, absolutely. But that's not the, you know, people were thinking, all right, this team doesn't make mistakes, and they got Matty Ice. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's why the numbers swung back. And then it immediately, as soon as it got back to 2.5 by Sunday, there were places where it was pick and minus 1 um, for the Packers. Yeah. So, like, there was a huge, huge swing from the public in that game. And the Packers, I think it's one of those things where you just got to look at the last four games now with the NFL. And, you know, they had that swoon in the middle because Andrews and all that. But right. just throw everything out and you just look at the last five or six. Well, that's what I was talking about with a bunch of guys this morning. I was saying, you know, give me some stats or some trends. Like, what are you guys thinking about right now when you're talking about the numbers and the the teams that you're – sort of leaning towards, and they all universally said, at this point in the year, you're not talking about stats, you're not talking about trends, you're going on what you see. And what they see right now is a Packers team, what everybody sees is a Packers team that took care of the the Eagles pretty easily and then destroyed the Falcons. Um, And I'm seeing a Packers team that did a really good job against the Bears in a game the Bears were trying to play um, and then also should have killed the Bears in week three. Uh, at Chicago. So, 
you know, maybe I'm jaded because I have such low expectations for the Bears, even at this point in the game, but uh, I just feel like the Packers, at their best, are a better team than the Bears. And, you know, if you're going to make the case for the Bears, part of that has to be the whole pack, the Packers shoot themselves. I made that case last week when I was picking Atlanta. Like, the Packers have a history of outplaying the other team, but not but not beating them and doing a couple of things to kill themselves. But I don't think they do that. They haven't been doing that the past month. Right. They killed the I think, Giants. I think that's over. I think it, well, I think it's over. I think they, they, I think they had a history of doing that because they were always injured. I mean, they Although the, the Eagles game, they could have blown. I mean, the Eagles had that ball in the 30, 30 seconds left. And they easily could have come back and won that game. Eagles could have won that game, and we would have said, wow, the Packers. Oh, the they sh- oh, my God, they gave it away. But they didn't give it away. Yeah, but it was – it was. I mean, I, that was why I was partly in that mindset. I was still thinking about that game. God, it sucks to be a gambler. It really does, because you don't know which way to go. You don't know which way to turn. You know what, though? I think – I'm going to have to go back and look at this. But it just seems like you're just going to have to look at this now and say – Every round, something weird is going to happen. I need to figure out what that one weird thing is going to be because it's just not conventional anymore. We haven't talked about sort of the theory behind the, you know, the Jets and the Steelers played each other this year, too. I know. And it's... And that game think, opened at six and ended at three and a half. That game... That game, that, that first regular season game, that regular season game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a six point... The, the Steelers were six point favorites in that game. It was partly because that was just such a big game for the Jets and not huge game. Pa- and Steelers and Palomalu was about. out, so they opened right. at six, and then Palomalu went out, so it drifted down to three and a half. Um, but that was a must, must win for the Jets. And that game, you know, there was that safety that happened with like two and a half minutes left in the game. Yep. That basically changed it from the Steelers needing the field goal, which they drove down the field and could have possibly gotten to tie it, and the touchdown, which they couldn't get. Um, all that sort of, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about as well when I'm thinking about the Steelers. Chad Millman, crunch those stats. Talk to those dudes. Do what you need to do. Friday, you, uh, I thought that column on Friday, which unfortunately posted after I had written mine, had some good stuff in there. And yes, it made I me question it. my picks. Uh, especially when Teddy Covers gets really agitated about something. He does. It's never good to be on the side against the side that Teddy Covers is agitated about. I didn't feel good after that. He's, you know, he gives great analysis. I, I love talking to him. He is as clear-headed as it comes to win this, to this analysis. Yeah. All right, Chad Millman. We'll talk to you in a couple weeks. All right, Bill Simmons. I'll talk to you later. All right, bye. Bye. All right, last thing. We're going to call my buddy Jay Buck, diehard Pats fan. He was in the building yesterday. We'll see if he picks up. He might not. He's pretty distraught. He's upset. He didn't like what happened yesterday. Hello. You can't talk for two minutes? I guess I can talk for two minutes. Talk in a very subdued, disappointed voice. Yeah. I don't need any help with that. Um, what was it like in the stands yesterday? Uh, it was really, really, really good in the beginning. And really, really, really bad from probably the three-minute or maybe five-minute mark of the first quarter on. Just the interception seemed to shift the momentum, not just on the field, but in the stands. Everybody was kind of like, uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah, it was It was very strange. It was strange. It was, And you know what? It wasn't strange in the beginning. It, the crowd was good. I, I thought it was good. I remember looking over at Nico and being like, the crowd's good today. This is a good crowd. And then then the interception back, and it felt just, you know, I mean, you could say it didn't, I don't know, they didn't get any points out of it, but... We didn't get any points out of it, and we were driving, and then it was just awful. The, the whole day was awful. Uh, awful because you knew it was against, and and then you stuck with Pittsburgh or the Jets in the Super Bowl, which is even more awful. That's uh, my question. That's why I'm calling you. I don't. I don't even. I have no interest in rehashing uh, the debacle yesterday. And I good. Think we're all I, disappointed. I can't talk about it. Well, other the one thing you you texted me that in person, I don't think it came off as well on TV. Was just. You thought our line just got destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, I thought the line got destroyed. I thought that. You know what? Here's what I think. And I, I think that we beat them by too much the last time we played them, and their defense was humiliated and embarrassed and pissed off. And maybe, you know, maybe it was even going in, you know what? We're going to 
you know, we might not beat these guys, but they're going to know they played us. And then once that interception happened, it was yeah. like, wait a minute. Not only are they going to know they played us, we're going to beat these <laughs> because they're vulnerable right now. And that's what happened. It was like, I think that changed the momentum, but more important, they came not to be humiliated. Yeah. That's the bottom line. They went in and saying, no matter what happens, they're not going to do to us what they did last time. And then, and then once there was an opening, they took advantage of it. Our team didn't seem as fired up as it normally seems. Was it, am I imagining that? Or I just felt like the Jets were flying around, hitting each other's helmets and yelling at each other. And, get, and our team kind of seemed in a, in a little bit of a daze. Something happened with, uh, with I mean, Welker shot out that first down. And obviously there was some, there was some punishment for what he did with that interview. And Yeah. I meant to give I, you the heads up on that. I, knew, I actually knew that was going to happen. Yeah, maybe – you know, maybe that took away a little bit, or maybe that was kind of a, a deflator. I, I don't know. All I know is that they wanted it more, and what what can I I hate them, too. I hate to say congrats <laughs> to them, but I hate them just because of the way they are, the trash talk. I hate it. I hate it. But you know what? Well, they, came out, they, they kicked our ass. They killed us. Do we need to raise our games and maybe do some of that? Because if you remember the good old days... Even though we we didn't do the uh, the before the game trash talk as much during the game, a lot of swagger, Brewski showing the ball on the sidelines after the fumble, and like we oh, yeah. we used to do that stuff, and it doesn't seem like we're doing it as much. Maybe you need no. to do it. No, we're, I, I, are we too? Are we too? Are we too docile? We're too nice. I'm speechless right now. I don't even know what we are. <laughs> I don't know if it was like. I don't know. Maybe our hair is too long. Maybe I don't know. Maybe we're too nice. Maybe I have no idea. What's there's it not like? That many uh, guys left over from that team. It's not like there's there, there should be guys that want it. Yeah, it shouldn't be complacent. And we seemed young. We seemed young yesterday. We seemed a little bit young. And and you know what? Actually, I think that. So you bring it up. It's like yeah, you had that pick that came back, and then they were covering us so tight. Yeah, it's not like they were bringing the house at us, but the coverage was so good. And then when you have the young guys. They can't read the coverage, and they're not, you know, there was one play where, where Brady threw it behind Gronk, and I thought, is that Brady's fault, or is that Gronk's fault for not picking that up and then, you know, going where the ball should have been because of the coverage? So I had no idea if it was just, you know, rookies just not, not stepping up because they didn't know what to do when, you know, everyone was covered. I, I don't know. I, I was dumbfounded. What, uh, it was, it what was do you depressing. think, the, you know, Massachusetts has been, like most of these guys, destroyed by blizzards. I think you have like a foot and a half of snow there, but it's like it's not even the good snow anymore. It's turned kind of brown and black from the it's dirt great. and oil and all of the weird stuff that goes into snow, and and it's and cold. And now the Pat season is over. What's the mood like going to be in Massachusetts this week? It's going to be so much. I was talking to a guy who's like, "Hey, KG's coming back tonight." I was like, "Oh, great!" <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was like the the high point was that we get KG back tonight. Well, we have there's some Celtic games coming up. Playing yeah. Miami again and the Lakers in Orlando. There's a nice stretch in about, I think it's in uh, three weeks. Maybe that'll get people going. But I think this is going to be a tough couple of weeks. I, I, certainly, I I think we all knew the, this Pats team had flaws. It wasn't like 07 where we were like, this team's a juggernaut. We're going to win. But um, I, I just didn't think that the flaws would come out against the Jets. I wanted to play the Jets. Yeah, but you thought the, the, the flaws, you thought it was going to be 45, 35 flaws. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 I, 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 I touched down twenty one flaws. No, I thought. See, I didn't want to play Baltimore because I thought Baltimore could do to us what the Jets did yesterday. I just didn't yeah. think the Jets could do it. I knew if we lost, it was going to be one of those, not a lot of possessions, the defense, you know, doing weird things, and 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 then teams grinding out long drives against us, making. I didn't think the Jets were the team that was going to do it though. Yeah, but you know what? Here, so here's the thing. Also, it was it was cold yesterday. In the afternoon, it was fine, but at night, it started to get cold. And I was thinking, you know what? They get a better team for this weather. I mean, there's no if there was snow, if it was a little rainy, we'd be all set. But yeah. they've got the running game in this weather. I mean, it, it's not. It can't be easy to catch a ball when your hands are numb. Yeah. And if, if you can run the ball, like they had a better, they had a, they had a better game plan. But they had a better team for this type of weather. I thought. When's the last time someone had a better team coming into New England for the weather conditions? It yeah, wasn't snowy. Weird. It was just cold. Yeah. And it was just obvious throughout the – it was – It reminded me of uh, – It was tough. wasn't it was quite cool. as cold, but it reminded me of – in uh, I think it was 03. 
Tennessee, the 17-14 game, and Vinatieri kicked that brick to to win it. Remember that game? It was round two. Yeah, but we had a running game. No, but I'm saying a type of running game. I'm saying the weather kind of nullified the home field advantage. It wasn't quite as cold as that game yesterday, though. Oh yeah, no, not even close. Yeah, no, no, that was that was the Robert the Bruce game. That was yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. All right, here's the big was, question, Bug. Here, here's hear. why I wanted to have you on. All right, who do we root for in the Steelers Jets game? Probably the two teams I hate the most. Um, Armageddon. You know that storm cloud on Yahoo that's over California? Yeah. I'm rooting for that just to go over Pittsburgh and the game gets wiped out and the NFL ends forever and <laughs> no one wins that game. All right, but who do you root for at gunpoint? I kind of <laughs> I feel like we root for the Steelers. I think we have to root. Here's the thing. I think I'm rooting for Green Bay is what I'm rooting for because I think it's going to be the, it's probably going to be the Steelers, maybe the Jets. I think the difference between Manning and Brady and Roethlisberger is that if you get Roethlisberger out of the pocket, he's, he's going to hurt you. Yeah. Where Brady and Manning are just not, they're not quite the same. No. As in Roethlisberger, I mean, they can pull that with him and he might come up big on him. So I think Pittsburgh's going to win the game, and it might be a close game. I was really impressed with the Jets, though. I mean, I hate them, but they impressed me. And Bart Scott at the end, everyone's complaining about him, you know, getting multi and showing no class. I thought that was real. I'm like, yeah, that yeah. guy was real. He's basically explaining everything they felt just like that. Yeah. Disrespecting us. They blew us out. Anyway, Pittsburgh. I'm, I'm, I'm going for Pittsburgh. So we hope they, they beat the hell out of each other. Pittsburgh wins, and then Rodgers or Cutler yeah. trounces on them the next round. That is correct. But right. probably what's really going to happen is that the Jets are going to win, and then uh, Chicago is going to somehow beat Green Bay, but Cutler's going to get hurt, and Hester's going to get hurt, and the Jets are going to win the Super Bowl by <laughs> 40, 40 points. I'm going, to pick, I'm going to pick the Jets just to put the kibosh on them. That's one of the, <sighs> things, I, that's one of the things I plan on doing this week. <sighs> no, I mean, it's not like the Steelers are a better alternative. That that. That's probably been our biggest rival the last 10 years. People forget yeah. this Jets team has not really been a rival other than the last couple, like the Rex Ryan since era. Rex came on board since Rex yeah. got there. Steelers yeah, are the, the team. The guy's good for a rivalry, that's for sure. The Steelers thing goes back to Bledsoe in that era, and, you know, 96 and the 7-3 to game in Foxborough and when Drew threw the pick, and that was the game we kind of looked at Drew and we were like, ooh. Is he? Uh, oh, the Drew? fog game or Cordell Stewart having that cheap freaking run where he's out of bounds and they yeah. held up on him and then he ran the touchdown and it was seven six. I, yeah, that's that that is a bigger rivalry. I mean, a bigger rivalry, not so much. I think more important games have been played against Pittsburgh over the past fifteen years than than the Jets in the past three years even. Plus, it was it was lined up so nicely for us because Pittsburgh. Those offensive linemen limping off left and right, and we've had, and the, their fans are terrified to play the Patriots. They just don't. They feel like we have their number. And it was like, can we just get there? Can we just? Can we just uh, that game? The, the Jets. They got to be salivating. Uh, the Jets. They're riding high right now. They're confident. It's gonna be a. It, it just it's fate, right? It's gonna be a six and a six. It's gonna be Green Bay and the Jets. Yeah. Crap, crap. I hate that. I hate that. Yeah, you better pick the Jets. <laughs> Uh, I actually yeah, I, really, I really think they're at least it's a three point game and they might win. I, I don't. I thought the Steelers, by the skin of their pants, got by that Baltimore team. Oh, I don't skin know. Of their skin of their pants. Skin of their pants. Oh, that that and Peter King and his Monday morning quarterback. He he, they had, he had a great quote from Roethlisberger, and it was, "How have you beaten this many times?" And his reply was, "Luck." Well, that you was, had uh, if gambling were legal, you would have had Baltimore in the over pretty heavy. I remember you said. I, I, yes, I, I would have had them um, heavy. I mean, that would have been really agonizing if you had money on that game. Yes, it would have been rather agonizing, or or worse if you if you did something similar with Seattle and it was a if they had like real lines and it was a ten point spread, for instance, and it was uh, an eleven point game and they kicked the field goal. Uh, <laughs> they kicked the PAT uh, over the two point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or or if uh, yeah, no, nah, unless I'm. Needless yeah. to say, um, guys that like the over did really really well this weekend. Yeah, the over hit all four times, right? Yes, or no, not not in the Pats game. Did it hit in the Pats game? It sure yeah, it did. did. It was 45. If it That's were right. In the paper, if it were legal, it was 45. That's correct. That was one of those games that, let's say, there were bookies who um, took illegal action in the Massachusetts area, and everybody had overrated the Pats, and they probably maybe could have bumped that line up to 10 points, maybe? Yeah, that's probably what happened. And then maybe <laughs> the money line and stuff, and they really would have cashed in if... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that they definitely cashed in. 
So we, you and I exchanged more legal. You and I exchanged some emails about the Super Bowl. I assume you're not going now. Yeah, no. I don't. No, I, I was. I, um, I was asking just about the event, not if the Pats were playing, but if you know, there's an event going on in Dallas that weekend. Right. You know, what would it be like? We we hedged the email conversation uh, very explicitly and carefully. Yes, um, we did. I uh, I no longer have an interest in, in going down to uh, I, sporting I, event. too. I, too, will not be going down to Dallas. Well, here's I, what we have. This is what we have. This is what we have to hold on to. The Celtics. Yeah. Very, very most likable Celtic team, I think, since uh, Bird era. I love the I, Celtics team. I really I, attach to them. I'm not in disagreement with you. And then... Uh, and then the, uh, a Red Sox team that I'll actually enjoy watching day in and day out for 162 games. You, what you won't do is enjoy watching them for, from 12-inch seats. The seats are 12 inches wide. I won't so enjoy. I will enjoy them on my big TV, though. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. I, every time I, Adrian Gonzalez comes up, I'm going to watch. When Crawford's yeah. up, I'm going to watch. I'm going to be excited for his triples. I'm excited I, I, in general. I, I think we're going to be good, but I'm not going to. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to talk about it. Because I'm, uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm just kind of devastated after yesterday. You know, I'm a little bit in shock. So I don't even want to talk about any of the teams. I don't want to jinx them. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do anything. I haven't even called my dad yet. Usually we <laughs> talk after every game. I haven't, just haven't. I probably talked to him on Wednesday. I feel I better than Buck. I think your dad's in high spirits. He sent out an email today that was really, really funny. So. Oh yeah, my dad's winning our picks league. <laughs> <laughs> Judging by the content of his email, I think he's okay. Yeah, he's all right. You know. it's... <laughs> It's. I think it's when you when your team gets beaten legitimately and you and you finish the game and you go, wow, they just we just lost. I mean that team is better. I think it's much easier to take. That yesterday was much easier to take. Like much the Giants easier. game, I will never get over. And every time the helmet catch play comes on, I'm going to get mad and I'm going to think about the hail mary to Moss for the rest of my life. And I'll never be over that game. This this game, I I'm already almost over. I'm pretty much I'm, – I'm, I'm right there with you. Someone asked Grover yesterday uh, where his Jets shirt was. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the people in the stands in front of us, because once they muffed the fake punt, he, he said, I'm out of here, let's go. It's like, this game's over. Uh, and it was 7-3, and the guy in front of him said, where's your, where's your Jets shirt? And rather than – most times you go have a little back and forth. Yeah. And Grover just looked at him and said, what, do you want to go with me or something? <laughs> There was no, there was no time for like a two minute conversation before that came out. He just said it just like that. I was like, all right, Grover, PC'd with Grover, let's go. Yeah, yeah you've been PC'd. And I was gonna drag him out to the park, and I was like, no, I'm not going anywhere. He's like, the where two, are we uh, this game now? I was like, oh, all right, the oh, two, okay. <laughs> we were on eggshells after that. The two uncharacteristic Pats moments were the muff punt because we just we never even take chances like that, you know. And if yeah. we take chances, it's gonna work every time. And then um, the other thing. I thought was uh, what was the other thing? Oh, um, the floater, the floater. What? The floater, the floater, the, the floater from Brady. I mean, that was oh. characteristic. But again, that goes back to I. I blame that on the line because if you look, I don't know if you saw. I, by the way, I haven't listened to any. I have yeah. not read other than Peter King's column or listened to any. I listened to the radio on the ride in this morning, like yeah. music on the radio, and. If you if you watch the game, I don't know what it looked like on TV, but it looked like there was someone in his face that should have been taken out, and he wasn't, and he threw it, and he was like trying to get it around him or over him or whatever, and it, it went too much, got in the wind or something, and then that was that. And that again, I felt like that went back to like someone didn't pick that guy up. Yeah. I don't Bad know. game. All right, Bad. we'll write it up. We're gonna say something. What 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 was it? I mean, I don't what, remember. One? You you said the second thing. Oh, the uncharacteristic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, the what? Just Welker talking trash and doing the press conference, which was really funny, but not the kind. I mean, that's like the Belichick way is to never ever do anything to enrage the other team before the game. Yeah, and he did, and he, he did. did, and they and he benched him for the first series because of it. But that was uncharacteristic. That and the the twenty minute drive in the fourth quarter, even though it was only fifteen uh, minutes, it was a twenty minute drive. That was, it was kind of people was were yelling, people were pissed off. That was like again, people were pissed about that. It was Eagles Super Bowl Thirty Nine, but the but the reverse. It was awful. It was awful. All right, Bug. I feel better. I'm glad we talked this out. We got the Celtics <laughs> and the Red Sox, and uh, and so I had everybody uh, back home for me. I will say hi, Bill, and you better move back home. There's a giant cloud that's gonna like drop. I guess ten days worth of rain on you. Uh oh. Talk to you later. later. Talk to you. 
target to set off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.